Professor Metzinger. Yeah, yeah, you must be boss. Uh, yes, it's very nice to meet you. <laughs> We are having this conversation, mm -hmm. and I have a feeling that I, I, Bas Heine, I'm talking to you. You seem to say in your work that it's that is a kind of trick, that it's a kind of illusion of the self. Well, let us take an example. We see colored objects around us. Our world mm -hmm. is full of colors. They are properties of a virtual reality that is running in your head a dynamic virtual reality. Now that model of reality we have in our brain, it says there are objects, they have properties, mm -hmm. <clears throat> there is now, and time is flowing in one direction. The physicists have long told us it's all not true. It's not true, mm -hmm. you know. There are no colors, there are no objects. Ask any physics professor. Um, Time is not unidirectional in the sense we experience it. And then our brain says another thing. They say, it's me. Mm -hmm. There is someone having it. And what I'm saying is that self-consciousness is itself a model. It's an internal model in the brain. And that's one of the most beautiful things about consciousness. We all have the feeling right now we are directly in contact with reality. You have the feeling, you just look at me. Mm -hmm. It's effortless. It's immediate. You see me. But it's not. It's a model of you and a model of me, but they are transparent. And that is why you get this phenomenology of reality and directness. And that's a fantastic invention of evolution. Imagine you were on your computer desktop and you're moving your mouse pointer around. That's not what's happening in the computer. It's a user surface. The mouse pointer is a self-model. It says, I am here and now, and I can do something. Now, imagine you were on your computer for so long that you would forget that this is a screen. And you would identify not with your arm and your finger, mm. but you would identify with the mouse pointer. That's our situation. In the next 50 to 200 years, I think, the tools are going to get much better and more precise. And we have to ask the question, what states of consciousness do we want? What is a good state of consciousness? Which ones do we want to show our children? Should there be states of consciousness that are illegal in our society? Should the individual have a right to mental self-determination? or? Everybody could also ask themselves, what state of consciousness do I want to die in? And can science help me um, to reach that goal if I've made a decision of how I want to die? If one realizes that the so-called self is nothing more or than a, a bunch of neurological processes, doesn't it create a kind of uh, moral no man's land. You know, first God was taken away as shown to be mm -hmm. an illusion, and then this now the self is is yes. project is a kind yes. of illusion. And I think that people will become more fundamentalist. Yes, I think you are very right in what you're saying. Many people don't say, uh, see this. I think human, humanity is going through a bottleneck, through a historical bottleneck, and it has two main components. One is, on the outside, we have climate change, and in the next centuries, we're going to have a crisis in the outside world that is completely new, and that doesn't go away. And so we will realize that we are failing beings. We know about climate change, and we cannot change our behavior. But then all the science comes us and says, there's really no self, no sharp identity. And this will hurt people emotionally. Uh, there are scientists and intellectuals who think this is no problem and they discuss about it. But we should never forget that more than 80% of the 7 billion people on this planet 
are deeply living in religious, metaphysical images of man. And they are not ready for this. They have never heard of a neural correlate of consciousness, and they don't want to hear about it. And they have never heard about a self-model, and many of them don't want to hear about it. And the information also comes just out of those countries that have colonized and oppressed them in the past. Mm -hmm. It's a very tricky situation. So I can imagine at least two ways in this in which this could go wrong. One way could be that many people say, this is too much for me. I need a simple worldview and we have a fundamentalist backlash. So religion comes back. Another way could be that many people have a vulgar kind of materialism and hedonism and take the wrong conclusion, okay, the sensory pleasure is all there is, I'll try to exploit my 70 years and just become very egocentric. So if we have many new ways of changing consciousness and changing self-models in children, in animals, but for instance also in criminals, uh, imagine you have a pedophile or a criminal, we have these cases, who asks for his brain to be changed. Should we do it? Because the person themselves asks for it. It's just like with a patient who asks he wants to die. Mm -hmm. um, imagine a criminal says, I have done horrible things. I want my old self-model to die and I want a new self-model to be born. Should we accept their wish or not? So... One thing I think almost everybody can share, a Christian, a Buddhist, an atheist, a neuroscientist, a secular philosopher, is that we should continuously minimize suffering in all beings that can suffer, not only human beings. To increase happiness is a much more tricky thing because the ideas about what that is are very difficult. Um, as Karl Popper once said, the attempt to create heaven on earth has always created hell so far in our history. So maybe we should just be a little more modest and not develop a positive vision of where we want to go, but just face the fact that there is an enormous amount of suffering and confusion on the planet and always ask how can we minimize suffering. So I think in a liberal, open Western society, the first thing we should do is to maximize the freedom of the individual. We should be liberal. So I think in our constitution, there should be a right to mental self-determination. In principle, I can do with my own brain what I want to do. Now that is very easy to say. It doesn't cost me anything to say that. Everybody will say, hooray, you know, I want to do to my own brain what I want to do. But then the more interesting and difficult question is, is how do you minimize that liberty again if you take into account other people's self-models? For instance, if you want to say, I want to be stoned all day, that's my way of living my life, your children also have a right to a father that is not stoned, perhaps, or your wife, you're a taxpayer. So then you also have to minimize freedom again in an intelligent way. So I think we should ask two questions. How can we maximize freedom for the brain and the mind of the individual in a way that doesn't inflict with the lives of other people? You know, that is just, that's very difficult. And how can we minimize suffering uh, with ev for everybody involved? We are beginning to understand how technologically we might intervene in the brain. It's an open experiment. It's historically new. We don't know um, if we will be able to deal with it. When human beings first tried out heroin or alcohol, nobody knew if we would be able to deal with it. And it took a long time until we just learned what the risks are. Uh, and many, many people died before we understood what the risks of this technology are. So I think many of the things we see in science reports, 
may actually not come to us so fast. Mm -hmm. um, I think the big surprises will always come from an unexpected corner, mm -hmm. not from what we expect, but mm -hmm. technologies may, there may be a synergy between different technologies. Maybe optogenetics, virtual reality, and some pill together, three things in 20 years, does something nobody thought about. But then we have the usual problems. Uh, we have the problem of commercialization. Who will profit from it? The taxpayer has paid the scientists. They have invented it. Who gets it? Can the health insurance pay for it? For instance, if it's a medical technology, can everybody have it or is it too expensive? Another problem in ethics is dual use. Will there be an application by the military? Uh, in Holland and in Germany, we don't have torture. But in America and in China, we have torture. If these technologies are out, they may be used in a military way, for instance, by secret services and so forth. It's not realistic that we can prevent it. That's one problem. If the knowledge is there, the cat is out of the bag. Mm -hmm. So one important question is, if there are actually things we should not do, mm -hmm. maybe there should be some kinds of scientific research. We have parts of this with certain artificial viruses where scientists just say, we'll not do this, it's too risky. So maybe there should be some things that we should not do, because if we learn how to do them, we are too stupid to keep it under control. We have 4,000 years of philosophy on this planet. People have thought about all kinds of things. Is there anything that matches modern neuroscientific um, knowledge, the thing that is rising on the horizon. And I think Buddhist philosophy, 2,500 years ago, they saw some core ideas, like, for instance, that there is no substantial self. They were the people who said that first, and they were the people who developed technologies, meditation technologies, to try to change the human biological mind so maybe that's a good starting point, mm -hmm. but it's not secular, you know. Uh, the Dalai Lama is a very open-hearted person, but he's certainly not secularized. He's a religious leader wearing funny clothes. So the question is, can we find a new way through this between fundamentalism and cynical materialism I have no ready-made answer, but I think that's the core question.